Hey everybody, it's Ronnie from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. One thing that is clear when you have a conversation with Ceci Juno, thoughtfulness is the theme to her work, whether in the studio or in the hospital treating patients. Her songs are soothing, yet at the same time catchy, and seem to draw from jazz, pop, folk, with traditional Latin inspiration as well. Ceci is a graduate of the Berklee School of Music with a degree in music therapy. She's an active neurologic music therapist in her home country of Ecuador and serves as a true ambassador of this important field. Ceci is a vocalist, pianist, guitarist, and songwriter who currently holds the number one hit song in Ecuador. It's called Fantasmus. I sat with Ceci between lectures at the annual American Congress of Rehab Medicine, where music and the arts have really come to play in the last few years in the same space as treatment and science for people with neurodisability. It was a pleasure to learn about Ceci's journey, dual passions, and her growing success. So here is our conversation with Ceci Juno at the ACRM in Dallas, Texas. Hola, soy Ceci Juno. Estoy aquí en Dallas con eh, Ron Hirschberg y hemos conversado hoy un poco sobre la musicoterapia y la composición en Above the Basement. Así que muchísimas gracias por el apoyo y por escucharme. Ya nos vemos. ACRM, mm-hmm. 95th year. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. We met a few years ago at another ACRM, and Brian Harris, mm-hmm. who's a mutual friend, had introduced us through Music Therapy World. Because yes. you trained as a music therapist. Exactly. I was his intern. That's right. So you were at Spalding? I was at Spalding, yes. Okay. And were you training at Berkeley or Leslie or where were I, I graduated from Berkeley and then I went to do my internship at Spalding with Brian Harris and then I took my neurologic music therapy training. It's fascinating. It's been around for, I know, like 18 years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit what NMT is. I would say it's a music therapy approach. It's a very evidence-based on the neuroscience research that, just like you said, has been around for 18, 20 years about the way that music affects the brain in all of the uh, different domains, such as cognitive function, sensory motor, uh, speech language functions. So NMT has 20 different techniques where you use these principles of the neuroscience of music to maintain or recover some of the neurologic functions that are uh, lost in some patients. I always think what is very interesting about NMT is that, like you said, you're using the musical input in different domains that affect cognition and memory and attention and walking, but it's to aid or help recover the non-musical exactly the, areas, the right? non-musical functions that we use daily. Which really kind of live in the same areas of the brain that music hits. Exactly. So, Ceci, you were trained in academia as a music therapist, but I know you wear two hats, and I'm very curious about what started first, and tell us a little bit about that other part of your life, that passion. Mm-hmm. I would say I started songwriting before uh, discovering this this passion for for health studies and health sciences, but it was always a tough decision for me to kind of pick between music or going to med school. So you did medical school in Ecuador, right? Yes. Okay, one year. One year. Do you remember, was there a point, was it early, mid, late, was there something that you can remember 
where it clicked, something triggered and said, I need to pursue music? Well, it was many things. Of course, I was already very involved in the crazy life of medical students, which can get very crazy. And also, I got a call from the dean of the music college at a university in Quito. This university is a Berkeley International Network. So a Berkeley College of Music International Network. And he had heard something about me and he called me to ask me if I would be interested in auditioning to go to Quito first to kind of start their Berkeley program at Quito. And of course, I left this out, but Berkeley was my dream school. Ever since Before I was going Yeah, to ever since I was like 9 or 10, I auditioned to get into Berkeley when I was in my last year of high school. I got in, but I didn't get a scholarship. You can't get student loans if you're not a US citizen. So basically there was no way for me to go to Berkeley. And But in Quito, there was but Exactly. There was this program that was it was the same curriculum as Berkeley. It was just in Quito. But that came later. So when I got into Berkeley but didn't get the scholarship, I kind of took it as a sign. I was like, okay, maybe med school is the way to go. I went to med school. And then, like you said, there was this moment where something clicked. I was very overwhelmed with, obviously, the amount of work. It's not that I don't like the work, but I, I miss music. I had Music had been my life for more than 12 years. I started studying music when I was five, and all of a sudden I had to put that on hold, go to med school, and it was not a matter of I haven't done music in a year, but this is going to be my life. And so that idea was very overwhelming. Mm. The dean for this Berkeley International Network called me and asked me if I'd be interested in auditioning. I took that as a sign, too. So I was like, wow, this is a really cool opportunity to kind of... Well, when the dean calls you, I mean, <laughs> it may be a sign, but it's <laughs> exactly. also... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I don't know, I took it as a second chance to go to my dream school. And so uh, I went... I auditioned, I got in with a scholarship to go to Quito. Quito is the capital of Ecuador, is not the city where I live in. Mm -hmm. I live in the second largest city of Ecuador. Uh, it involved moving away from home and everything, but I said, okay, this is, this is my chance. And so I started a contemporary music program at this Berkeley International Network and obviously fell in love with music all over again. But you weren't falling in love with music therapy at this not point. Not yet, not yet. But it, did you feel that some of... Did you feel when you were younger that you were getting a therapeutic effect, effect of Absolutely. music during that stress of med school? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I started writing my own songs when I was about 12, and I think that's what got me through all my teenage years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was a way for me to make sense of all these feelings oh, yeah. and hormones and God knows what. Mm -hmm. So definitely, I always had that understanding of, of the therapeutic effects of music, but I honestly didn't know until I got to Berkeley that music therapy was an established field, sure. which is really funny because when I was in high school, we had to do this really intense research project in order to graduate, and I did it on melodic intonation therapy ah. without having an idea of what music therapy was. I know melodic intonation therapy is considered more of a speech a language intervention, but of course it has tons of musical elements to it. And so when I got to Berkeley... This well, it's was, one of the mainstays of, an, of a neurologic music therapist. It, exactly. And when I got to Berkeley, this was 2013, and I realized music therapy is a thing. So the combination of health and music is a thing. First of all, my entire world just clicked because these were my two biggest passions since I was mm. born. And then I learned about melodic intonation therapy and I was like, wow, like my whole life makes mm. sense right now. A quick sidebar of mm -hmm. MIT. Can you just summarize that for people? Oh, yeah. So it's an intervention. It was uh, originally developed by speech language pathologists, even though it, it's called a melodic intonation therapy because it used... It uses elements of melody and rhythm in order to regain speech functions in patients with non-fluent aphasia. You know exactly what you want to say, but you don't have the, the, yeah, the language functions to say it. And so the rhythm, what I've seen is that in therapists in using MIT is that the rhythm actually literally taps into the right side of the brain that will trigger the left side of language. Exactly. Right? The rhythm and the melodic component of it 
Cause together. Together. Because yeah. there is some evidence that uh, melody is processed by the right hemisphere. Mm, interesting. So that way, if you have a left side stroke, that's your affected side. That's where your language centers are. And through melodic intonation therapy, you're using the right hemisphere of the brain. And yeah. so uh, you're technically bypassing the affected area. Right. And that's also the explanation why so many people who've had a, a left side stroke can sing but they can't speak and right. so that's how they they compensate right they compensate yeah, yeah. That was my, my confirmation that I was in the right path. Uh, it was maybe a couple of semesters into my Berkeley life and my music therapy major where I realized I could also get back into songwriting and, and begin to take huh. it a little bit more seriously huh. this huh. time. To this point, I think my songs hadn't really left my room. Um, <laughs> I was the only person who had... Uh, listen to them. Of course, when I was in, in Quito and I started my bin school, I showed them to a few of my mm-hmm. classmates and everything, but I don't know. They, they tell you so, so many times through music school, like you really need to have what it takes to become a musician and like there's so much music out there and it's scary to mm-hmm. put yourself out there mm-hmm. when you know there are so many amazing well, musicians in the world. Yeah, it's scary to le- have them leave the room. And we, <laughs> you know, as you may know from the name of the podcast, I guess we could have thought it outside the room. It, but we called yeah. it above the basement. Above the basement. So yeah. that's that's that comfort level thing. Exactly. Getting out there. So exactly. your out of the room above the basement moment was in the middle of Berkeley School of Definitely, Music. Definitely. Yeah. And you were in Boston. I was in Boston. Yeah. Yes. And so you graduated. Yeah, but I technically started to put myself out there and consider myself a, a solo artist during that time. During that time. Your path is so interesting because the interest in medicine put you in a place where you realize how much your passion for music really was. Exactly. You connected with Berkeley, and that gave you the opportunity to get into a field that is very rewarding in mm-hmm. health. But you then realize, wait a second, I'm a musician, and I'm a songwriter. Exactly. And I can do both. So tell me about that. Tell me yeah, about so where we are now. Yeah, so we were just talking about this the other day. I told you how much of a struggle it is sometimes because even though they're both music fields they can be very related conceptually but in the logistics of it it can get really hard because it comes to a point where I see patients by day Mm -hmm. and I sometimes have sound checks in the afternoon and I Mm -hmm. gig at night I don't know I'm in a hospital setting by day and I'm on a stage by night so the people that I work with are not the same the wardrobe is not the same do you feel like you're kind of uh, Superman and Clark Kent yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of that in some of these in some of the analogies in this field and so so you'll be seeing patients in the hospital regularly or is it Monday through Friday type of thing Monday through Friday yeah and so do you I have, have a full so, schedule or can you uh, it's I would say it's uh, part-time. Mm-hmm. Um, I see some patients in the hospital and I see a lot of my patients in home because of their condition. A huge part of my work in Ecuador, because I, I forgot to say that, I'm, I'm in Ecuador mm-hmm. right now. Right now, right. A huge part of my work is also the advocacy portion of it. Huh. So I would say it's part-time with patients and part-time preparing in-services, preparing research, preparing mm-hmm. presentations on NMT to try to teach people not only about NMT, but 
about music therapy as an alternative for many health conditions. They don't know a lot about it yet. Right. And do you feel that you're you're kind of alone? Or do, how many people are, are in Ecuador that are... I know only two or three certified music therapists. Mm -hmm. I do not know another... And certified too. neurologic music therapist. Yeah. I think I'm still the only one. Mm -hmm. If there's right. another one, maybe they're in Quito, not right. in Guayaquil, which is where I'm from. Right. So it can get very lonely, very isolating to not be able to compare my work with uh, someone else or learn yeah. from someone else. In the United States alone, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of resources and there's the most NMTs, of course, you still have most areas of the country that have never heard of NMT yeah. or even music therapy exactly. and don't use it. In a sense, you're not alone, and but it is <laughs> exactly. growing. It's been a great success story for Ceci Juno. Yes. <laughs> with your night job, the stage. So tell me about that. Yeah, this year has been amazing. I went back to the studio. Mm -hmm. I'm about to release my first full album because I haven't... Well, I have two EPs out, counting the one that I released with my band, but I also have one EP as Ceci Juno. It has six songs, and that's the one that I promoted all of last year and kind of toured for a little bit, but this year went back to the studio. I'm very happy to say that I felt a huge evolution in my sound, and it's amazing how kind of building your team with amazing musicians and amazing people, how much that can do to mm. your sound as well. This new EP is out. What do we call it? I'm still deciding okay. what, what the uh -huh. name of this album is going to be. I'm in between either a self-titled album okay. and Fantasmas, which means ghosts. And oh, okay. it's the name of my first single, which is the one that got That's, to number one yes. and on one of the like biggest radio stations in Ecuador. So that was pretty what's, cool. <laughs> what's, congratulations. Thank you. What is the name of the radio station? Uh, radio City, actually. <laughs> radio City is yeah. based out of Quito? Yes, okay. yes. And, and you you have the number one hit song now? Yes. The, how often do they play this, do you think? A few um, times a day? Or? A few times a day. They they Actually, they play my music a lot. They've been amazingly not just supportive. Not, not just my hit. But it was very surprising for me because this hit has been out for a month and a half. Your family's there, they hear it on the radio. Yeah, absolutely. You're driving, you Lots of my it. friends and family just send me voice notes of like, hey, you're on the radio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very exciting. And what what is the name of it? Fantasmas. Oh, Fantasmas. So you yeah. may call the album that, you're not sure. You yeah, think? I'm actually very inclined to calling the album that. <laughs> I think we're going to announce it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a song that means... We We'd be honored to announce it on the oh, podcast. Oh, that'd be amazing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantasmas, I like yes. it. And it sounds like fantastic, of course. Thank you so much. I mean, that's just very, you know, <laughs> ethnocentric of me to yeah. say in the English language. But, you know, I want to circle back a little bit to training in music therapy and that cerebral academic approach where you're thinking about how melodies affects memory and you're thinking about harmonies and you're thinking about improvisation. Mm -hmm. All of these things are discussed and taught in yes. your musical ther music therapy curriculum. When you go back to the studio, when you write, are you conscious of those things? Do they affect your writing? Do you think about that? I don't think, like whenever I sit down and write, I don't think I actively think of these things, but I think, uh, like thinking back, my training as a music therapist has definitely impacted not only the way I write, but the way I view music and the way I view how people receive music. Mm, how it affects them. Exactly. Exactly. I'm very aware of how my music affects those who listen to it. And I like being aware of that because, you know, there's so much content in the world nowadays. Mm. And I really want to have an impact through music. And it's yeah. helped me put into music the stories that I want to tell. And not only my stories, but people's stories. How people would express what they feel through music, which is something that not everyone is able to do. Like, I want to be, again, that channel. It kind of ties back to having melodies that are accessible, having rhythms that are accessible. Above all, like, my greatest goal when I write my music is for my music to be relatable to people. That's what I want the most. I heard your song the other day. It was a beautiful song. And I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> but it doesn't matter in some ways. 
I don't know what they say in the opera. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Obviously, in classical music, you can be moved mm -hmm. without words. Yeah. Is there that element of the non-storytelling? Is there the element of the melody that you yeah, strive for? Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I, I do want my melodies to be accessible. I don't want yeah, them yeah. to be difficult melodies that no one can sing or harmonies that somehow make you feel uncomfortable and i know it's important to have those like ups and downs in music where you you have to express a wide spectrum of feelings <laughs> i have been told that that my music can be very soothing mm -hmm. i mean that makes me happy yeah, <laughs> always right. makes me happy to hear Hey, it's Chuck. I just wanted to say I'm so glad Ronnie was able to connect with Ceci while at the ACRM conference, and I'm sorry I could not be there myself. That said, you can purchase Ceci's music and learn more about her at cecijuno.com. That's C-E-C-I-J-U-N-O. Go to AboveTheBasement.com where you can join us on Patreon. Sign up for our newsletter, listen and subscribe to our podcast, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and look at all the nice pictures we post on Instagram. We are everywhere. On behalf of Ronnie and myself, thanks for listening. Tell your friends and remember, Boston music, like its history, is unique.
How would you like to join us in creating great conversations that inspire and connect? Patreon is a membership platform that provides a way for creators like us to build relationships and provide exclusive experiences to subscribers or patrons. We have been self-financed since we got off the ground in June of 2016, but in order to continue to fully invest all we can in each episode, we need your patronage. For more information, please go to patreon.com forward slash above the basement. 